All right, this is the 2013 New York Physics Regents exam, the free response questions. I'm only going to be reviewing the mechanics questions from this exam. I'm going to be skipping over everything past momentum, so from electricity on. Uh, this is because this is going to be used as a review for my mechanics unit only. So I will be skipping any problems that are not mechanics, or I will be crossing them off. This question, uh, the first one, is a great example. This is actually not the first question in this test. This is, I think, the second or third question. We have a baseball bat exerting a force of 600 newtons east on a ball, imparting an impulse of 3.6 newton seconds east to the ball. We want to know the amount of time the baseball bat is in contact with the ball. I'm going to go to make a knowns list. I'm going to say that the force acting on the bat or the ball itself is 600 newtons. It's east, so I'm going to treat that as positive. We know it's going to impart an impulse of 3.6 newton seconds, also east. We want to know how much time the ball was in, bat, in contact with the bat. Hopefully you guys can recognize that this is an impulse problem. So impulse is force times time. This equation is in your reference table. So the time is simply just the impulse divided by the force. Or 3.6 divided by 600. Because I made a knowns list, including my units, I do not need to substitute my units in right now. I get a time of 0 0.006 seconds. This will be a total of two points, one for the answer with units and the other for all of the work that needs to include substitution with units or knowns list with units. Okay, I'm skipping over to number 57 now. 57 through 59 have a speed versus time graph. It's for a car moving in a straight line. We want to first determine the magnitude of acceleration of the car. Hopefully you can recognize that the slope of this graph is indeed the acceleration. This is because slope is rise over run. In this example, the rise is velocity, the run is time, or speed is the, the rise, and speed versus time is indeed acceleration. So ultimately for 57, all I need to do is determine the slope of this graph. And the slope, and since it's only one point, I don't even need to show work but I'm going to for you. And I'm going to use the slope from 0, 0 to 10, 8, because I think that's the easiest to see my nu my numbers properly. So the acceleration is the slope, which is the rise, which from the two points that I picked will be 0 to 10, or 10 meters per second, over your run, which is from 0 to 8, or 8 seconds. We're going to get a slope of uh, 1.25 meter per second squared. Now because you were calculating slope and you weren't necessarily all going to pick easy to read spots, they, there is a plus or minus 0 0.05 meters per second squared that's acceptable. So anywhere from 1.2 to 1.3 meters per second squared could have worked. 58 59, we want to know the total the distance the car traveled during the time interval of 4 to 8 seconds. So we're looking at this period of time I'll change my color here, 4 to that 8 seconds. Actually, I'm going to get rid of all of this, these notations that I already made, so this is a little bit easier to see. We want to know the distance traveled from this period to this period. Now, there are a couple ways you can go ahead and do this. Because you now know the acceleration, you can go ahead and use kinematics. You know the initial starting velocity at 4 seconds. Just got to look at this graph. It's 5 meters per second. You know the amount of time, 4 seconds, and you know the acceleration. You could do d equals vit plus 1 half at squared. You could also do the area underneath the slope at this spot. You could just figure out the area of the graph right here, just this one segment, which is a triangle and a square. Now, whatever you think is easiest to do. I'm going to go ahead and use kinematics simply because. Why not? So again, I'm taking this point to this point. I'm going to make a little knowns list. I know my starting velocity, the velocity at the 4 second mark is 5 meters per second. I know there's a time of 4 to 8 seconds, so that's 4 seconds. I know the acceleration from up top of 1.25 meters per second squared. And I'm looking for my displacement. Well, the displacement is VIT plus one-half of AT squared.
Often when we use this, vit is zero, but in this example it's not. Our starting velocity is not zero. So we have to keep this. So it's going to be five times four plus one half of 1.25 times four squared. You get 30 meters for the answer. And again, you could have done slope. You actually could have done a couple different things here. This isn't the only kinematic solution either. You could have broken this up into segments, added it all together, whatever. Whatever route you take, I think this one was probably the easiest route. All right, moving on, I'm jumping ahead to number 63. And this is dealing with a circular motion problem. We got a 28 gram rubber stopper attached to the string. We're going to roll it in a clockwise and a horizontal circular path of radius 0.8 meters. And we have a diagram. And we know the speed of the rubber stopper, 2.5. So we first want to determine the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration of the stopper. We do need to show our work, including the equation substitution of units. So let's go ahead and do that. What do we know? Let's make a just knowns list of everything. We know the mass of the stopper is 28 grams. Be careful if you end up using that. We don't want to put that in kilograms. We know the radius of its path is 0 0.8 meters. And we know the velocity of the stopper is 2.5 meters per second, or at least the speed. It's not really the velocity because its direction is always changing. And we're looking for the centripetal acceleration. Well, if you look in your reference tables, you'll see centripetal acceleration is simply v squared over r. We have v, so let's just give you 2.5 squared. Don't forget to square it, and we're divide by 0.8. And you will get an acceleration of 7.8 meters per second squared. Two points. Show your work. 65 in the diagram in the answer booklet, we want to draw an arrow showing the direction of the centripetal force acting the stopper when it's at the position shown. So we're going to just draw right here on the diagram, and we are looking for an, a line, an arrow pointing in towards the center. You did not need to label it, but you did need to have an arrowhead, and it needed to be pointing inward. You are not allowed more than one arrow unless that arrow is correct and labeled appropriately. So please just draw the one simple arrow. Avoid drawing next to things like the tangential speed and things of this nature. Alright, that's it for the circular motion problem. I'm going to scoot ahead to number 70 now. In number 70, we have a girl riding her bicycle 1.4 kilometers east, or west, I'm sorry, then 0.7 south, and then 0.3 east in 12 minutes. We've got the vector diagram in our book, and we know the scale is 1 centimeter is 0.2 kilograms, or I'm sorry, 0.2 kilometers. And so in the vector diagram, we're going to use a rule and a protractor, and we need to construct the following vectors. They want us, and it's very clear, we need to start at the arrowhead of the second displacement vector. We need to draw a vector to represent 0.3 kilometer east displacement. So let's make sure we understand what's happening here. The girl um, rides her bicycle 1.4 kilometers west. That's this first arrow. Then turns south 0.7 kilometers now we know she travels another 0.3 kilometers east, but that vector isn't drawn yet, and that's what we're doing first. So we need to first draw that 0.3 kilometer east vector. You got to use a ruler, and you got to make sure you remember that one centimeter is 0.2 kilometers. So if this is supposed to be 0.3 kilometers, we need it to be 1.5 centimeters. Now I'm not going to use a ruler because I know this is not to scale. I've shrunk this to fit it into this computer program. You should use a ruler to make sure you're doing it right. It says label the vector with its magnitude, so that's what I just did. You get one point for that. And then you're going to draw the vector representing the resulting displacement, and we do need to label this R. So, remember, your resulting displacement always starts at the tail of the first and finishes at the tip of the last. So we're actually drawing our vector this way, and we're going to make sure our arrowhead is pointed down towards that most recently drawn eastern vector. We have to label this R. That, too, is worth one point. Seventy-two through seventy-three, when we, we want to know her average speed for the entire trip. We do need to show work, substitution, equation, the whole deal. And so, recall, if you look in your reference tables, the average speed for any object is going to be the displacement or change in distance over their time. Well, since we're looking at speed, 
I'm going to use the word distance here, not displacement. Average speed and average velocity are two different things. Speed is total distance over total time, and velocity is displacement over total time. This actually makes our work a little easier because distance is a little bit easier to account for. You just add up every value. You could add up the 1.4 kilometers plus the 0 0.7 kilometers plus the 0 0.3 kilometers. You can divide that by the total time. The total time was 12 minutes. You can actually leave everything in kilometers and minutes. It didn't uh, clearly state that you needed to convert. Uh, so if you leave it in kilometers per minute, which I don't normally do, but there's nothing wrong with that, is 0 0.2 kilometers for every minute. If you chose to convert, you likely would have converted both your kilometers and your minutes, your minutes to seconds, your kilometers to meters, and you would have got an answer of 3.3 .3 meters per second. They're both fine. It doesn't matter what you pick, as long as you stay consistent. 74, we want to know the magnitude of the grill's resulting displacement for this entire trip in kilometers. For this one, they, we would uh, the ideal solution would be to use a ruler. Since we know the scale is 1 centimeter is 0.2 kilometers, let's go ahead and measure this red vector that's drawn labeled R. Measure how long it is and divide uh, the number, or not divide, multiply that number of centimeters by 0.2 kilometers. And uh, you're going to get a value of 1.3 kilometers. Because you're measuring, you do get a little bit of degree of error. So they would have accepted anything from 1.1 to 1.5 kilometers. Finally, number 75, we want to know the measure of the angle in degrees between the resultant and the 1.4 kilometer vector. So it's this angle up here, theta. Take your protractor, place it at point P, put the origin at the point. Go ahead and measure that angle. You, see, you look at it visually first. You can see it's going to be a relatively small angle. And you should get a value of 35 degrees. And again, you get a little bit of flex. Anywhere from 33 to 37 would have been perfectly acceptable. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to move ahead, and we are on number 81. All right, 81 is dealing with an inclined plane problem. It's a dynamics problem with forces. Um, we have information up top given for this whole set. We have a 30.4 newton force. Use the slide of 40 newton crate. Distance of 6 meters at a constant speed. Uh, to a vertical head of 3 meters. We want to know the total work done by the 30.4 newton force in sliding that crate. Uh, there's no work we need to show for this one, but I'm going to anyhow for 81. I'm going to do that down here. I'm going to recognize that work is force times displacement that's parallel because we have the force and the parallel of the displacement. I don't need to worry about cosine. So it's going to be 30.4 newtons times 6 meters. It's just going to be the force that you're applying over the distance that it travels. You're going to get 182 joules. 82 and 83, we want to know the total increase in the gravitational potential energy of the crate after it slid 6 meters. That's that distance it just traveled. Well, because there's no energy loss, Is there energy loss? There might be actually. It doesn't say. I'm trying. I'm reading this right now. Yeah, you know what? It looks like there probably is energy loss. It doesn't indicate that there's uh, energy loss directly, but it says there's constant speed. So if we have one force up, there's got to be another force down. So we got to go ahead and calculate that actual increase in gravitational potential energy. Well, PE is mgh. Well, we know the mass. Kind of. We know mg. It says it's a 40 newton crate. That is the weight of the crate. So that's mg. So we're going to say 40 represents mg times its ultimate height. It's going to, well, it's going to get to a height of 3 meters. So it's going to gain 120 joules of potential energy. Nope, I would have lost the point here. i got to put 3 meters. M. 84, we want to know what happens to kinetic energy the crate as it slides along the incline. A uh, key thing here is to read the words constant speed, constant speed. A lot of students want to say the kinetic energy decreases, but it doesn't. Um, it's actually going to stay the same. It remains constant. You don't need to explain why. In fact, I'd almost encourage you not to. That way, if you're wrong, you don't lose a point. 
I just got to say that constant or kinetic energy is the same or remains the same. Uh, 85, what happens to the internal energy to create as it slides along the incline? Here's one where you do have to recognize what's happening here. We've got a force causing the object to go up the incline. Its speed is staying constant. Now, normally it wants to slow down as it exchanges to potential energy. Normally it wants to slow down as it experiences friction forces. There are frictional forces, so we have an additional force that we're putting into it to make everything constant. As such, we know that there's definitely going to be energy that's going to be transferring uh, and so we actually are going to find that the internal energy to create increases, increases, which is the answer any time we have, it's the answer any time we have friction. And my program doesn't want to write right now. There we go. We're looking for the word increases. Okay, that'll be it for this exam. Again, this is just the mechanics questions from the 2013 physics regents exam.